Welcome to Being the Genuine Athlete podcast, where we inspire those who aim for excellence in life and want to understand the how and what it takes to be a champion in life. My name is Jura Koschak. My purpose, dedication and commitment is to activate your potential, that you understand the ego through your sport and life situations. So I share and give you the tools to be just this, the genuine athlete. Are you ready to tune in? Thank you for joining us, dear listeners, for of Being the Genuine Athlete podcast. Uh, today I have a special guest, Dr. Michael Hartel from uh, USA. That is which state? Indiana. Indiana. So he joined me in a way to present his uh, practice. He's a chiropractic, uh, and I'm about to read something about him. So he was raised in the frozen tundra known as Minnesota. But you lived in Hawaii as well, while your father was uh, stationed there in Pearl Harbor, in the Navy, I presume. Yep. You've been practicing this uh, chiropractic in Fort Wayne in Indiana for the last 23 years, more? Uh, 24 years this year, yeah. 24, yep. yeah. Uh, you're a former nationally ranked powerlifter. You won several national titles uh, with powerlifting. Uh, you were also chairman of different com- committees. Uh, you funded some. Uh, you have very uh, big uh, powerlifting uh, uh, numbers. 1,840 pounds. That's a lot. In your weight class, I presume that that's a lot. Uh, I'm not as huge as you are. Uh, so uh, in the muscles, I mean. And you also played some semi-pro football in your career uh, as a defensive tackle. Uh, and here it says that you loved it. Do you still oh. play I absolutely love playing football. You know, I played uh, uh, in seventh and eighth grade. Then I didn't play in uh, my freshman, sophomore, junior year in high school. I decided to play in my senior year and then um, decided to go into powerlifting. And uh, when I decided to, you know, hang up my powerlifting shoes and my belt, just to retire from that, I decided to look into something else. And a friend of mine was playing football. And so I looked into it and absolutely loved it. Uh, you know, going on the field and, in um, I play defensive tackle. So I'm in the scrum of the, uh, offensive line, defensive line. So there's a lot of, uh, hitting and everything else as far as football hitting. Oh, my patience. I say, you don't have to worry about me losing my, my, uh, temper with you because I lost it on the weekend playing football. Great. So it's, it's, uh, adding uh, to your personality character and your practice. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, the only injury I had playing football is I sprained my right ankle and I uh, was playing again three weeks later and, you know, never looked back. So Great. Um, you treat, train and advise to all kinds of patients from babies to elderly, from youth athletes to NCAA student athletes and also professional athletes. Uh, you coach junior high football and track and field volunteering his time, your time for 16 years. Uh, you have three sons and three grandchildren. Yes, Four. sir. Yes. Yep. Uh, and they keep you very busy. Yes, they do. Yep. So I, I presume you, you do a lot of sport activities with them as well. Not my grandchildren because they live up in Canada. So oh, we okay. don't, uh, we do, we do some Zoom calls, some FaceTime calls and everything else. Uh, see them maybe once, twice a year and stuff like that. Um, it's about 1,500 miles from where I live, so we don't get to see him very often. I'll fly up there, like I said, uh, a couple times a year. Um, but, uh, you know, I absolutely love them. They're, the oldest has just turned seven. Um, so I got three, uh, three young grandchildren. Uh, but my son, uh, my oldest son, Colin, he's 30 years old. So uh, they're his children, and they're, I love them to death. Great. So you're a family guy. Yes, sir. And I presume yep. you, you transmit this uh, vibe uh, also to your patients so that your clinic is uh, more of a family-based one. Yeah, when we bought the clinic many years ago, uh, we changed the name to uh, Allen County, which is the county that we're in, family and sports chiropractic, because we take care of everyone from babies to older people. Um, and then also, too, I'm uh, certified as a sports chiropractor. Uh, and I, you know, obviously I played football, I did track and field, I, um, you know, did power lifting, but you know, I treat all sports. We have tennis players, we have golf, we have, as far as people who uh, do lots of running, um, people, all that stuff. So we take care of a lot of sports injuries, 
uh, in addition to just you know general aches and pains and everything else. Uh, and uh, good that you mentioned you are a board certified clinical nutritionist as well, certified chiropractic sports physician, active release technique, uh, and certified strength and conditioning specialist. You also are a certif master strong first certified instructor with strong first. Uh, and you developed the barbell certification. Yes, the uh, the guy who owns the strong first name is Pavel Satsalein. Okay. And, uh, he and I got our brains together and we put together the SFL manual back in 2012, 2013. And uh, so we spent about six months, a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, putting it together and, and we have our finished product. Great, and that's with the barbell's kettlebells yeah, strong first we have, we teach body weight exercises, we teach kettlebell exercises and barbell exercises. So that's with the barbell part. Um, but I'm also, as far as a master of strong first, I'm one of the years, like 14 or 15 of us around the world that are master instructors. Um, so uh, I'm one of the master instructors. What, what does that entail, the master title? Uh... Master is the highest rank that you can get as far as in the organization of strong first. And uh, means that we, we teach at certifications, so whether it be body weight, barbell, kettlebell, we teach that those things. Uh, so the barbell and kettlebell generally are three-day certifications. The body weight's a two-day certification, uh, mm -hmm. but we're the lead instructor. We're in charge of it there. We may have some assistant instructors and everyone else with that too. A lot of great people in our organization. We have uh, some a master, then there's a senior rank, and then there's a team leader rank. Um, like that. And so, you know, I moved up from being a student to a team leader, a senior to now a master. Yeah. And do you uh, also use this, not maybe in your clinic with the kettlebells, you have additional practice that you do? Well, I do use kettlebells um, in, in my practice. I do. We also have physical therapy rehab here at my clinic. So we also do that. So I do use kettlebells as far as a lot of training. It's, uh, it's a lot, um, it's a lot faster, a lot easier to get set up with that. Uh, one of the basic moves that I teach, you know, a lot of my patients is how to do uh, a kettlebell deadlift. And basically you're just deadlifting a kettlebell off the ground and it's very, you know, you pick it up, you move it over here, you basically lift it up and you deadlift it. So, uh, very similar to the barbell deadlift, but not as, um, time consuming getting it loaded. You know, you got to put plates on a bar, you put collars on a bar and everything else with that. Boom, I just pick up a kettlebell and bring it, boom, ready to go. Um, and a lot of patients use it to help get their stronger, get their glutes uh, activated, get their hamstrings going, get their abs going, get their lats, all these things, which are sometimes in a lot of people contributing to a lot of their issues and their pain. Uh, I had experience with uh, REP, the Accelerate Recover Perform performance, if you heard. Okay. It's, no, I haven't heard of that. Um, this uh, neurostimulator, neurostimulator, and it's like uh, first it um, initially it uh, exactly pinpoints where your core issues are, uh, and and so that it then mm. sees where the energy, where the muscle is not functioning, where the energy is not flowing, where it's a block. Uh, so I had maybe I had a hip pain, but uh, my mm. hip was okay. So the issue was in my thighs. Uh, in my uh, quads, in a way, uh, so that is where we find, found, and pinpointed the exact issue, the core problem. Uh, and then, when you apply this neurostimulus, that's like 500 uh, signals per second. Uh, it it makes mm. like think that your brain thinks that if you do one squat, uh, the brain thinks that you did like 500 squats in a, in a second. So it's a stimulated right. uh, recovery. Uh, cool. and, uh, I'm sure that I, I heard there, and also from a couple of. Uh, uh, shiatsu, chiropractors as well, massage, uh, massages, uh, they've already explained that the issue is with uh, ties, with your quads and ties, that the body, if, if these muscles are not so strong or they are weak, uh, people tend to have issues with uh, the spine or with the low back. Right. Very, very similar. Yep. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted that, that you confirm or maybe elaborate something on that uh, regarding squats or the ties and, and the connection with the, with the spine. Right. I think, you know, in, in the organization of Strong First, the reason we teach, you know, uh, the exercises, we teach movements. Um, so, for example, uh, in, my, in my gym slash physical therapy, a part of my clinic I have here, 
you know, I don't have any leg extension or leg curl machines, uh, but we have plenty of places where people can do uh, uh, kettlebell goblet squats, you know, where you hold a kettlebell like this and you squat down. Um, we have a couple racks where people can do barbell. Uh, you can do front squat, you can do zercher squats, you can do back squats. Um, we also have an area where you can do, if you wanted to do some power cleans or some hang cleans or, you know, power snatch, things like that. So we have plenty of places where people learn the movements of that, which is very similar to if I had to pick my seven-year-old grandson off the ground, I'm deadlifting him off the ground. You know, obviously he's a little bit longer than a kettlebell, mm -hmm. but again, he, I can still pick him up. So the kettlebell stuff, the barbell stuff gets my body stronger. And that's what I use for playing football all these years. So when I, when I stopped power lifting, which I basically was essentially only doing barbell stuff, I then move, uh, progressed to doing kettlebell and barbell, mm -hmm. meaning that I use both things to get me strong because, you know, when you, when you play a contact sport like football, you know, you get hit all the time. And especially on the defensive line, I'm hitting the person across from me every single play. Mm -hmm. So my body has, gets these little tiny um, uh, injuries, you could call it, which training the kettlebell, the barbell, even the um, body weight exercises, changes my body tissue so I have more resiliency. So I can, re if I do have a little injury, it's a little injury, not a big injury, which keeps me out of the next couple of games. You know, so um, actually when I hurt my ankle, I mentioned earlier, I, I missed three weeks of football, but we actually had, we had to change our schedule around a little bit. So I actually did not miss a game. Um, but I was, I was pretty, pretty sore there first few days. But then after that, um, I got treated and got a healed and, you know, got back to playing football. Uh, I heard like a couple of weeks ago that uh, a lot of researches that have been done that people who are successful in life, not just materialistically or financially, but like successful in life, being fulfilled and happy and thriving, uh, have uh, either martial arts, either army or sport athletic uh, background. Interesting. That That's makes like sense. the main co common thing, the main correspondent thing that then transpires uh, and transmits into being fulfilled, successful regarding discipline and everything else, how you input yourself and, and your muscle memories and, and uh, uh, right. how you are open and resilient and, and uh, in that, that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. I agree with that. Um, I think those three things actually uh, instill, um, discipline, self-motivation, all these different things into a person, which then carries over to their academic or financial life or even relationships and everything else with that. It's a principle that you copy on all different areas that you gain. Uh, I had a lot of experience as well with my clients that I coach and non-athletes. Uh, if you tell them train, train your mind, train your body, train your emotions, it's like train, yes, what is train? Uh, are we going on a train? Do we need a ticket sometimes? <laughs> it's <laughs> like that. Otherwise with athletes, it's uh, like it's in the system. It's a chip. It's a programmation right. that you are already ready. You say train and you go. Uh, that's also totally agree with you on that. Yeah, that's yeah. also I got uh, from my career when I was a table tennis player. Um, and just let's head up back uh, a bit. You mentioned uh, deadlifting babies in a way. Uh, I heard about, uh, do you, because you work with babies, do you do also some baby handling for parents? Because you can handle babies that they use their own muscles already, even if they're small, small babies. You talk about treating babies in my clinic, you mean? Uh, yes, or maybe if you teach parents in a way, not teach, but show them how to handle with babies, how to lift them also well, yes, with squats and, 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 and that the, they take yeah, care so of their spine. There's two things there. First, I do treat babies. My youngest patient in my office, uh, he was uh, two days old. Wow. And his mom brought him in because she wanted to breastfeed him and he was not latching onto her breast. And the woman was very distraught because she wanted to do that, did not want to bottle feed or use formula and wanted to breastfeed him. So she belonged to a thing called the uh, Lelici League. And it's an organization here in the States that basically women get together and they, it's kind of a, a community together. They teach them how to breastfeed and take care of all that stuff and everything. And someone re uh, referred me. And so I said, okay, so 
what I found on him was that he had a few of his cranial bones were not in a proper position and then a few of his cervical vertebrae were not proper. So I adjusted the baby and that night um, he latched on for the first time, but he was wow. still having some difficulty. So over the course of the next couple of weeks, I did the same adjustments and everything else. And eventually he was latching on fine. And then I released him from care and then the mom was very happy. Um, wow. The youngest person I ever adjusted was my middle son, Anthony. Um, I adjusted him when he was two hours old. And my youngest son, Marcus, uh, was able to adjust him when he was four hours old after he was born. Oldest son, I did not adjust him because we were in school at the time. So I had someone else do that um, and everything. Adjust, you mean uh, what? Adjust, as far as that's what I do as a doctor of chiropractic, is I'm adjusting. Uh, there's 206 bones in the body. Between every bone, there's a joint. And so I adjust all the joints in the body. And basically, it's a uh, articular change. It's a neurological change, a muscular change. And then eventually, a per person starts to feel better. It starts to function better as well, too. Um, so I'm using my hands to adjust them, uh, whether it be the neck, whether it be the wrist, whether it be the ankle, whatever else needs to be adjusted. And I go ahead and adjust them. And that we use my hands to do that. Okay. Um, the other thing you mentioned too is the fact of you know how you teach parents how to uh, carry babies or whatever else. So for a lot, for example, um, I see this more in women than men. Women tend to hold the baby on their hip. Yeah. And I understand they do that because they keep the other hand free and everything else. And they cook they, and uh, maybe do the right. ironing. Yeah. Right. So, but the problem with that is if they always do the same hip. They start actually getting tissue changes both in the mus muscular but also the spinal area and the pelvis area and I can take an x-ray of them standing up without holding the baby and they're crooked and so I have to work on that so I say you know go ahead and switch hips if you need to do that mm -hmm. um, but or hold a baby in front or get a baby carrier whether in the back or the front like a backpack type thing um, so I do teach them that and everything else and make them think that way um, with my second son, Anthony, uh, when he was a baby, I was always holding him with my left arm. Well, I ended up getting tendonitis in my left bicep and my left brachioradialis so that when I was bench pressing, it was causing a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. So I had his mom work on me and get that rid of that. But then I started switching him arm to arm. I didn't hold him on one side for too long before I switched him to the other side and then tendonitis was gone. Great. I heard that story as well of, of one lady, only from one mother, but a lot of mothers uh, of babies have that issue with carrying on one hip and some cannot sleep and they don't know why, but they tend to have a baby like for five, 10 hours per day on that hip. Mm -hmm. So it's, And it's, you multiply that times day after day, then week after week, and now you got an issue. Um, Let's jump now into the, because the podcast is being the genuine athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I mean by that is genuine for me, what it represents some person, an athlete, regard, uh, doesn't matter with gender, that uh, they are authentic and pristine with their expressions, that they are aware of their emotions, body, mind, soul, mentality, healthy wise, so that they are broad horizon uh, mm -hmm. open in understanding life and how situations influence them or that they know if when they are genuine that they can influence the outside situations. So if we touch this, because you had a lot of, uh, with yourself and with your clients, uh, athletes, uh, experience um, regarding, like you mentioned now, uh, a mother that's carrying the baby on one hip, maybe tennis wise or other athletes, or they, or do some athletes have something in common, regardless of the sport that they come from, uh, like mothers that they have in common, the hip thing, maybe uh, some, some injury or, or some kind of, you know, position, maybe the thorax uh, or maybe something with the hips or uh, what, what is your experience? For example, we, we deal with a lot of runners, people who compete in 5Ks, 10Ks, you know, half marathons, marathons. And it's interesting because I find that runners have a, have a great mentality. There's a lot of, um, if you can use the term, discomfort going on when they're running, both in training and also during competition. They have to be able to tolerate that to be able to go through it and set a new personal best or whatever else. But runners with that mindset also kind of hurt themselves because literally they'll be 
walking into my clinic, dragging their right leg, even though they just went on a 10 mile run yesterday, they drag their right leg in and they can't even pick it up or anything else. Now, when they get to that point, you know, that's going to take some treatment. It's going to take some time to get them back to the point where now they can walk normal and run normal. When I say to the words to them, all right, we're going to do this temporarily. I want you to stop running for four weeks or two weeks. I have this horror look on their face like, oh, my God, what are you telling me? You're, you're freaking me out here. And I tell them, well, here's the thing. And I learned this from uh, Gray Cook, Brett Jones. We don't want to build if you – you don't want to build basically fitness on top of dysfunction. Okay. You want to build fitness on top of function. Yeah. So that's where, again, if you, if you take your, for example, if you build fitness or uh, if you build basically fitness on top of dysfunction, what happens there is that you also hurt your health. And that's where I mentioned earlier, the runner comes in dragging his right leg. He can't run and his health is affected because now his body he can't sit on a toilet properly. He can't uh, drive a car properly. So everything's being affected. Once we get his health back, then he can have all the function he wants. His dysfunction turns to function. And then we can get him moving faster. But I'll tell you what, when I tell him, hey, I want you to take four weeks off from running. You can walk, you can bike, you can swim, everything else. You thought I was saying I'm going to amputate your right leg. And, and I understand that. Because obviously they live for running. They, they, they go for that natural high and everything else that happens with that. So, um, but again, when I explain why we need to do that, they go, oh, okay, all right, cool. So then they, some, some people count down, okay, we're at 27 days. Tomorrow's the 28th day. That's four weeks from when you told me. Can I run tomorrow? Okay, do one more week or whatever else because you're almost there. You're not quite there yet. You know, and uh, yeah. so I have to laugh at that when, when people make comments like that. So it's coaching as well uh, that you need. Everybody's a coach in a way. Uh, so, um, well, with parents or with coaches in a way, everybody should need some uh, pedagogical uh, knowledge uh, that you can approach uh, and, and coach. Right. Uh, right. So I, I presume that maybe that's a common thing that you have with athletes how to slow them down, how to make them recover, prevention. Uh, I have this uh, like subject in our call uh, for this podcast, the prevention. How much are athletes open uh, in general and maybe specifically wise, uh, in your experience, you might say uh, for prevention or are they just make me heal now? Uh, do, on, do it on me so that I can go back. Right. Well, and I think, you know, a lot of athletes, you know, once you give them the right tools, you know, I always tell patients, I, when you, it's like you come into my clinic and I give you an empty toolbox. And through everything I give you, we're going to fill that toolbox up with all these tools that you can use down the road to help manage yourself. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you still need some, sometimes a second pair of hands where these hands work on treating them, you know, chiropractically and doing the ART and everything else with that. But again, sometimes we need to do that. But these toolbox will be filled up. The toolbox could be various uh, mobility exercises, various stretches, static stretches, various um, maybe supplements, being a board certified nutritionist, uh, maybe some strength exercises, all these different things, using ice, using heat, all this different thing, and teach them how to do all that so they can actually function better and take care of it. Sometimes they still need me, so they come in and get a treatment. Um, but again, we need to do that to be able to get them to function better. But prehab, I call that prehab, which you say as far as prevention stuff. And a lot of times we go from rehab to prehab. We're now, okay, we found some things that you're going to do to kind of undo the stress that you do to your body, whether you play table, te table tennis, you play football, you play powerlifting, you know, golf, whatever. And then you can go ahead and do that because you need to undo some of that stuff. They come because you've mentioned now first is rehab, then is pre or prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, but do they come before they need rehab? <laughs> Generally, no. Most patients come to my office and they're in pain. They don't use they don't uh, use the time uh, or the awareness. Uh, I come for this toolbox before I get injured. Or did you have that experience? Oh yeah, many times. And so people will take better care of their cars, better care of their houses. Yeah. better care of anything they use mechanically a computer whatever else 
than their own bodies. They don't do anything with their bodies generally until they're in pain. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, hey, you got to fix me in two days. Well, but also I, pain is like the threshold or the tolerance is with people is different. Right. But some people, I know for myself, uh, I, I'm, I can have a migraine and I don't know that I have a migraine. I say, oh, I have a headache or I can like limp a bit and it's normal for me because right. I was a professional athlete, professional athlete, professional injury in a way. Also, right. not head injury, but uh, because the result-driven, the ego result-driven person, uh, ambitious, uh, a lot of times we forget that the body is uh, something that we will use for our entirety, not just till our 30th uh, birthday and end of our career, because we also need to live forward. So, well, and you made a comment there. So you being a professional athlete and me playing powerlifting and, and football, our, our pain tolerance is generally a lot higher. Yeah. Because you learn to you learn to either mitigate or deal with an injury so you can keep going. Whereas someone has a boo-boo in their finger, they're out for three weeks. I can't do anything for three weeks. Okay, that's that's uh, sorry to disturb you, but that's what I do in, in my relationship. You know, if I cut onion or potatoes or something or salad and I cut myself, I'm also out of kitchen for two weeks. That's what men do, you know, so yeah. that, that's a normal thing. But otherwise, yes, the pain issue in sport uh, in comparison with the knife cut or something is different. But I understand, yeah. And, and uh, uh, how do you have these uh, athletes if they come earlier that they do not wait that the pain is unbearable or that the pain is already an injury? Uh, do they tend to have that signal? Oh, pain now. Not that they uh, get afraid, but that they have this, a wake up moment oh i need to do something now what like more of a, a slower a more uh, slow paced uh, awareness version approach yeah we have some of those patients we don't have too many of those patients just from the standpoint that you know pain is a powerful motivator um dysfunction is a powerful motivator when you used to be able to do this move and now when i do that move i can't do it very well and i have pain now, okay, I, I need to go get that fix. Then you go get that fix. And the one thing about the human body is that since we're all living tissue, that, you know, your body changes. Yeah. So I'm 52 years young, okay? I started playing football when I was 38. I stopped playing football when I was 48. And I can tell you that if I went back to, say, powerlifting at 52, that my recovery rate between each workout is longer than it was at age 38. And I knew exactly how long at age 38 it took me to recover. At 52, I have no idea. I can kind of guess, but I have no idea. So I'm, I'm slowly getting back into doing some training and everything else with all that stuff. But again, it's one of those things where most people come in when they are in pain and they can't do something. And so unfortunately, some patients choose what we call pain care where they just wanna work till they get out of pain and then they say goodbye and I'm cool with that. Just give me a call when the pain comes back because it's going to come back as a cause was never addressed. Yeah, yeah, the root so. cause, yeah, that needs to be uh, looked at. And, and uh, yeah, but the pain, as you mentioned now, maybe we can uh, stick a, a bit of, uh, around that. Pain, some pain that's mental, emotional, and physical, but it's not dysfunctional. It's not that something is going to be hurt, but you have muscle pain or something because you are pushing the limits uh, and you are breakthrough doing something but then there's other pain that's like and here uh, do you have like uh, uh, because you need to coach your patients as well not only fix and adjust them but you need to coach them look this is the pain that goes that's your pain that you can deal with it but this pain is an injury type pain yeah there's a dr craig levinson he's a chiropractor and he also does a lot of rehab and, and one of the things he kind of you know taught me and a few other people as well too is that when you're doing rehab or physical therapy with a patient, they don't have to be 100% out of pain to do that rehab or physical therapy. You know, I, I tell my patients, as long as when you're doing an exercise with me that your, your pain level isn't any greater than maybe a four or five out of 10, 10 being the worst pain, um, we're good to go. Because eventually what happens is eventually that pain level goes from four to five down to three, down to two, down to one, and disappears. Um, but if we waited till they're completely out of pain, it would take a long time before them to start doing exercise. And people, the human body, you know, loves movement. 
Yeah. And I'm sure during this um, coronavirus uh, situation where people have been staying at home a lot, bodies are starting to stiffen up. And so they're, they're finding they're having more pain. Um, I've had uh, a lot of new patients in the last few weeks from people who are basically sitting around their butts all the day because they're either reading a book, watching TV, or they're working on their computer for their job, but they're sitting, sitting, sitting. And these are people who would normally walk around and their bodies aren't used to that. And so you either use it or lose it. And unfortunately they're starting to lose it. So I need to bring them back to using it and say, go for a walk twice a day. Um, do five push-ups every hour, do, yeah. do a couple squats, do some movement things. Um, so. Yeah, I understand. Um, I had the thing when I finished my career in a way, when I stopped playing professional table tennis and already through the course of two, three last years, I was, I had a pause, a break in between third, three years back before I finished. And then I began back to play and train, but a little less than before. Uh, so then I just decided it's enough. And then I didn't want to hear about running, about powerlifting, about weightlifting, about anything, about training. Do not mention training because I was fed up. Mm -hmm. Why was that so? We all know how trainings are and coaches are and parents and pressure and sponsors and results driven people. But uh, I needed some time to actually give my space, my body just to, <laughs> and my brain as well, like just no running like somebody said i'm going running okay go you're welcome just go don't ask me so uh the, do, do you work also with post uh, or already athletes who finish their career oh yeah yeah we we do that and and here's what i what i try to teach them is i say okay think of uh pretend you're a power lifter and let's say you create you you write down a 12-week training cycle okay at the end of those 12 weeks Give yourself a week off. Don't go to the gym. Don't think of the gym. Don't drive by the gym. Um, you know, eat some ice cream that week. You know, drink a few beers. Just chill out and relax. And it's almost more for your brain than it is for your body. But you help this, you're going to help your body. Yeah, well, this is all the body. It's like exactly parts, yeah. So we yeah, need to have in, have in place. Uh, I'm going to just add this because athletes tend to forget about the mind in a way we just think i'm gonna use the body with our mind to will and we're gonna overpower it but <laughs> it's a dangerous game right and when you yet when you don't give the the mind and the body are connected but when the body even the body can start to break down and the mind's still active but when the brain starts to break down yeah. you got to take some time so when i played football i had four weeks after the end of the season where i did no training four weeks. It's a long time. But I mean, I would, I would do some um, uh, mobility exercises, like some goblet squats, just some light stuff, maybe some stretching. But I didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to do anything else. I went for walks. But after those four weeks, I felt uh, refreshed. My mm -hmm. brain felt ready to go again. And then I went back into when I was powerlifting, I'd take two weeks off, you know. So we, again, like you said, we got to get that brain back together and you mentioned earlier, if, I don't, if you don't mind me going back to what you said earlier, but you made a comment about people who have pain. And if I go and sprain my ankle right now, I got pain. But if that ankle sprain continues for weeks and weeks and weeks, the brain up here starts to get hardwired that the pain is there. So even though down there at the ankle, it's fixed, they still have the wiring up here in their brain that they have pain. And generally, you have to start thinking and visualizing that I'm not in pain anymore. And you have to do some work with the mind because that's fixed, but this isn't. You know, and that's where chronic pain, you have a lot of people have chronic pain, especially at professional athletes and things like that. They get chronic pain where they're always, their knees always hurt them, knees always hurt them. And eventually what happens is it, it continues on with that. And then you end up having some issues with that. Yeah. And now that you've mentioned the wiring and the mind, uh, as I've already asked you, you know Dr. Joe Dispenza and his work on visualiza visualizing and how, to, how he, as a chiropractor, I think he was also a practitioner, uh, he knew about his spine and when he was injured, um, mm -hmm. you know his story, how he began to work on himself uh, self and made this like a true a miracle recovery 
uh, that he did and then he was determined that he's gonna show this to the world how to wire yourself and uh, this is the part of the training that needs to be done uh, as you mentioned I as an athlete never had uh, like off maybe a week of training because I was in a national team we had the, the club uh, games in table tennis then I had a national uh, you know European championship or something and then we just began training again preparing for the new season so I I was so uh, full uh, in my mind, actually. So that is what actually made me that I started to read all the books and did yoga in, at the age of 15 because I was searching a lot of different approaches on how to relax my mind, not just the body, but my mind, because that is what I was aching for in a way, if I use the ironic word, uh, like searching for. So uh, I trust that you also open to your athletes. Uh, so... Uh, First, they get injured. Maybe they need to get injured a couple of times that they begin to think on the prevention, that you open their mind, uh, that they get ready for after the career, that they begin to think how to use their mind and body uh, uh, for after the career. Uh, and uh, I presume that you also mentioned to them maybe something about dispenser or in this area, how to visualize, how to wire themselves, as you mentioned now with the ankle and right. uh, with this example. Well, let's mention his book. His first book was called Evolve Your Brain, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. And it's a great book. And um, in there, he was involved in a bicycle accident that basically broke several vertebrae in his back. Um, they said he would needed to be fused and everything else. He didn't want to be fused. And basically, through the power of his mind, which I know some people are going to say, hey, that's voodoo stuff and everything else. He basically, with that and some other physical things he did, he was able to heal the fractures and everything else and get himself healthy. And so one thing in there, I made that book was he used a term called neuroplasticity. Yeah. And in that part aspect, neuroplasticity means that our brains can change. So I graduated from school in 93 with my doctorate. And back, even back then, people were saying, well, your brain is pretty much hardwired. You can't change it. No, nothing can change. And what he was saying, yes, you can change it. And a lot of other people afterwards came out and said, yeah, so now we're up with this, we can change our brains. So one of the things I teach about at the Strong First Certifications is that when I teach them a new pattern of how to squat or deadlift or bench press or whatever else, I said, for a lot of you, this is like you walking down a dirt trail in the woods. Okay, think, think of back in the United States back like 200 years ago. So the dirt trails in, in Nebraska and in Oklahoma now are, are four-lane concrete interstates. But to go from a dirt trail to an interstate takes many people going over them back and forth, back and forth. And eventually now it's hardwired into your brain. And when you get that neuroplasticity, it's important. So now that it's hardwired, but also if all of a sudden I got to get off that concrete road, go another dirt trail or learn a new pattern, my brain can do that. And I think it's amazing. So he, you know, I knew about this stuff in school, but he kind of really opened my eyes up when I read that book. So it's called Evolve Your Brain. Your listeners, I recommend they get that book. I'm sure it's in different languages and everything else. Um, but he has other successive books after that. But I think that Evolve Your Brain is his, his best book. What do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah, he has also as well the placebo, which I read, and Becoming Supernatural, and uh, Mind uh, Over Something, I think it's in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I have a card, like a paper, uh, and from a notebook, and uh, just recently I heard like explanation from a successful Olympic uh, medalist in swimming uh, from my country, and she explained Sara Isakovic, she also studied in Berkeley, uh, hmm. on neuroplasticity and neuroscience and she said our brain for something new is like this it's like you know it's plain so what do we do when we visualize and I used as an athlete a lot of visualization and still I do and as you said um, that uh, people say that uh, with if you say that you can um, influence your body with the mind that's voodoo or something well, we, we do everything with that. We cook. When we think of what we're going to eat, we don't look at the fridge, and we are in the fridge with our mind. So that's already visualization in a way. So it's not good. Yeah. That's what we do. When we make love, what do we do? Not that we fantasize. I'm not talking about that. But we visualize stuff, and we are in a different world. 
uh, and we, when we play sports. So uh, athletes have to visualize. And so Sara uh, Isakovic explained this. Uh, let's do this. Let's fold it a couple of times. You can count the seconds. Mm -hmm. So you need to fold it a couple of times. I don't think I can make it. No. Okay, so now we open. So that's the first time we do something. Right. Check now. <laughs> so these are neural pathways that also Joe Dispenza, doctor, explains. And a lot of athletes have come in contact with when it's the wiring set and you are trans transmitting your own uh, movie, your own uh, idea, vision, what right. you want to succeed, what you want to make it happen. You are there. So Sara said, uh, I was at the finals of Olympics. Uh, I'm not sure which discipline she was swimming, 200 meters uh, freestyle, I think. And she, was, she came second in. And she said that she trained the two years earlier prior to her final Olympic um, uh, this uh, race. Uh, and she said when she came there on that stand, she said, I did this already 300 times earlier. Mm -hmm. So this was this. So this is what we do. Also with injuries, we do this. Also right. with failure, we do this. So we, we are doing all the time this influence on our brain, brain neural pathways and connected with our own uh, muscles and everything. So this is what I am uh, invested in. And um, this is what is my prime determination and commitment and passion actually to, to help myself and people, of course, further on uh, and athletes, especially that they open, open the horizon that they see. Why do you need an injury? Sometimes, yes, we need a lesson and to learn something, but you need to have your hamstring uh, torn and your uh, muscles or bones broken or some injuries because you are so in a closed mindset in a way. Uh, right. Well, so it depends on a lot of people's attitude about things. So, for example, some of my patients, I'll talk to them about what you just said. And I'll say, okay, you sprained your right ankle. You're a runner. You can't run on it for, you know, four, five, six weeks. We can start walking. But what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes and visualize that you're running a 5K or a 10K. And when you visualize that, I want you to visualize that every time that right foot hits the ground, there's no pain. It feels just like the left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. And even though you, you are walking with a limp or maybe a cane or a crutch, still you can visualize that and that will actually help the healing process. Um, and some patients, you know, it, it, I can tell patients don't want to hear it or whatever else or are not interested in hearing it and that's fine. You know, I'll still take care of them. Um, but those who do want to do that tend to get better a lot faster and get back to their sport a lot quicker uh, when they do that. Yeah. Visualizes the brain power is the actually it's it's prayer in a way, maybe not so spiritually, but it's 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 contacting something in the future, uh, and um, uh, it is really important that athletes uh, begin to use the the intellectual device, not only the IQ but the broad horizon of intellect uh, on regarding. Uh, what what are they going to be? What's their body going to be and their mind and emotional because we can have injuries there as well on other platforms, other areas of our uh, life and body. Uh, what is going to be after my career uh, and prevention wise, uh, like Djokovic or any other, also Nadal and Federer, how they are coping. And of course, some uh, ladies, how they are in tennis, how they are coping with their uh, situation of their body and injuries that they gained uh, through their years of career that they didn't know because 10 years ago we didn't know stuff that we know now and oh, we yeah. have come a long way so new stuff are more and more confirmed and scientifically proven uh, and uh, athletes prove to themselves as well uh, so uh, they are now the these athletes who are above 30 maybe they are more and more taking care of their mind, body, spirit, soul, emotions, everything is more and more high tuned. It's not just take a racket and play and be the best and go work on small area of life. Everything is connected, everything. Oh yes, very much so. And, and for example, I remember hearing a study many years ago that they, they took, a, it took many people and they laid them down in a bed or a table and they hooked EMG probes up to their bodies. And what they were doing is they said, we want you to visualize 
a 500 pound barbell back squat, but we don't want you to move a muscle on the table. And the EMG readings were very strongly associated with the muscles that were involved with the squat. Mm -hmm. So again, they weren't moving a muscle, but the EMG showed that they were moving. Yeah. They actually found the muscles firing. So that also gave, like we talked earlier about injuries, that when an athlete's injured, one of the things you can do is you can actually do the exercises or movements or sporting whatever in your mind, but I can't move that joint, but I can still do it in my mind and it actually helps the healing process. Yeah, so it's, it's amazing uh, that, um, that that exists and that's possible, but it's amazing that a lot of athletes are still not doing it. No. They no, are so absolutely. confined, uh, influenced by the outcomes and that they need to have outcomes and the money-wise and parent-wise and expectation-wise. Uh, and it's amazing that we are, we are in 2020 and we live like in dungeons, uh, crazy, not using all the possibilities. And this is not, maybe you remember 30 years ago in 1990, uh, slowly it began to, to be in public presence uh, the, in the media like we can activate, uh, we live only on five or 10% of our brain capacity and gene capacity. Right. Now we are doing it. So that's not, that doesn't mean that they're going to fly like this or that when we will fly and float in a way that then we will be like 50% activated. No, that's activation that you begin to visualize and use all of the options of your uh, operational system, OS and everything, how to use all the organs, muscles, joints, uh, nervous system, and, and, and influence on everything with just the power of your, of your decision, determination, and, uh, and this. I agree. Totally agree with you on that. Very powerful. So uh, in that way, um, athletes um, is important now because they are role models. They, are, uh, they have a huge platform. Nowadays, there is no media. Everything is media. If you meet yes. uh, the last podcast I had, uh, this coach, uh, the professional tennis coach on WTA explained that uh, every little girl that has a cell phone, she's the media. If you're going to say hi to her, you're on media, you're on social media in a way. Right. So uh, uh, now it's important how these athletes are uh, transmitting their own awareness and, and how they uh, input uh, themselves in the situations and how they use everything not just some nutrition maybe some uh, rehab uh, like some masseur and some physiotherapy uh, and but i train a lot my forehand i need to do everything i need to enhance my forehand well like, sometimes uh, more is not always better yeah you know and so we teach that a lot at strong first that we have we want you to learn an inch wide but a mile deep we want you to really learn that because a lot of the movements we teach uh, apply to everything in life. Uh, again, like I said, if I picked up my seven-year-old grandson, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to use good form because he weighs, you know, 50, 60 pounds, you know, and same thing there too. So, but yeah, people, you know, not using their minds. Um, I think, you know, when I, at age 38, I started playing semi-pro football and people are like, why are you doing that at age 38? You do that in your early twenties. And I say, well, I'm in good shape. I'm strong. I don't have any injuries let's do it. And that first year was interesting because my football coach, he goes, he goes, doc, you're a good defensive tackle for the first step. After that, you stop moving. And I said, well, it's probably because for 20 years of powerlifting, my feet don't move because my feet are not moving when I'm powerlifting. So that off season, I started learning to, to run and react and everything else. So I started learning to move. And, and so I just I always laugh when I think about that. But again, it's also a mental attitude, yeah. you know, and I decided that even at age 48, when I finished my last season, I was older than some of the referees were. Mm -hmm. And they were out there with bum knees and couldn't move and everything else. But I chose, I wanted to keep myself healthy. So I always tell patients all the time and my athletes, you know, it's also an attitude, you know, and I want to go out there. So if I have an injury, I don't look at going, oh, woe is me. I want to say, what can I do to get that injury better? Mm -hmm. So I need, like you said, I need to use my mind and I also need to get it treated so I can do both things. So they both meet in the middle and hopefully I'm healthy from that point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And the thing is that uh, we get to a, an injury physical uh, and emo maybe first is emotional 
and then it's in, then it's physical injury. Uh, first is mental, maybe <laughs> that you are mentally stuck somewhere. You have a certain belief, certain mind set that is disabling you to move differently, to use yourself differently, and that is making you dysfunctional. And eventually, you have a torn muscle or something worse uh, in, of, a, of an injury. But the thing is, yeah. Regarding that, maybe you can explain some more these breakthroughs that you need to instill in an athlete, not just adjust them, but actually make those shifts in their brain, in their, like when you say the first thing, you, you shock them. You need to lay off everything four weeks now. It's like a quarantine now. <laughs> you need to lay off four weeks, no movement. And they're like, what? Yeah, because your movement made you this. So you need to change if you want right. to change the outcome. And that's a good okay. comment. So I would tell the runner, who is a huge runner, that I want you to take four weeks off from running. Doesn't mean stop moving, just no running. Um, and they look at me like, I'm one, I'm on drugs, or I'm, on, I'm doing something with that. And I say to them, well, here's the thing. Your running is what caused you to walk into my office. So let's stop that right now, get you healed, then you can go back to running. But the thing is there, too, is that, again, when people get injured, they need to know that they also need to take care of up here in the brain. And when they don't take care of that part, then they obviously are going to have the injury a lot longer. We talked about that earlier, that their injury is going to last longer. Um, also, too, that if their uh, attitude, like I said earlier about that, is not healthy. For example, I had a patient many years ago. when She was not an athlete, but when she came in, everything I did on her, she'd say the word, ow. Ow, 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 ow. I mean, literally almost like 40 to 50 hours per treatment. And so I looked at her one day and I said, Mrs. Jones, not a real name, but obviously, you know, I said, all right, I'm going to allow you to say ow only 10 times today. And when I, the moment I said that, when she became aware, oh my God, am I saying it that much? And I said, yeah, you're saying it a lot. So when she says ow, her ears hear the ow. It basically keeps reinforcing yeah. that negative aspect. Yeah, so yeah, when yeah, you yeah. say ow, you're being negative. Mm -hmm. So eventually she got to the point where she stopped saying, ow, next thing you know, her treatment took off and she got better a lot faster. And so I changed her. And it, so just yeah. changing that mental aspect mm -hmm. made her a lot healthier than she would have been otherwise. But no one ever said that about don't say an ow. She went to several other doctors and no one ever said anything. Nobody doesn't want to get into it in a way, or they don't put so much attention. And that's right. the deal with, uh, different uh, aspects or different sides of different coaches or uh, physicians that give you different background and different hear the stuff that they hear and 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 uh, become aware uh, right. yeah that, that's powerful the shifts and the transformation that's needed uh, and, and this is why i'm doing this and and putting this out this knowledge because in a way i thought before well this is all known the books are written the videos are out there yeah but somebody didn't pick them up yet Right. Or, didn't listen or, them, or listen to yeah, them. Yeah, or listen or actually put attention to that way. So it's, it's very important that these shifts happen before you get injured. Uh, I got injured. Uh, my first great injury was, um, I think, uh, this uh, um, emotional or psychological one because I didn't have a pause. I was just playing the whole year, two years. I didn't have a break. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a lot of anginas and flus because I was outsourcing my body and I was eating dairy and stuff that was not supporting my nutrition uh, right. and, and what I needed like as a teenager. But then I kicked the table, a table tennis table. I wanted to kick it like, you know, just a bit, but I kicked it from the bottom up. So I hurt my big toe and, and I broke a, a small fracture of my, uh, I still have that uh, in a way my toe is like this. And your phalange. They didn't put it out. So yeah. it's, it's a memory, and I have this memory when it's uh, really cold outside. Uh, <laughs> so it keeps reminding me, look at how crazy you were. You injured your, thankfully, it was just a small bone, right. but I can feel it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and this is what you've been call, saying, this memory-wise and the wiring-wise. So this is my passion to transmit, and I'm sure it's yours as well through all these years. How many athletes and people can you influence? Uh, that they behave differently earlier than late uh, and right. that they change. And, and uh, maybe just to wrap all of this, what we've talked today, very grateful and appreciate it. 
maybe if you can say some things about this uncertainty, because we are always living in uncertain times. It is always right. an illusion that we think that it's certain because we wake up, we don't have the quarantine, we don't have the war, we don't have this and that. We have some stuff that happen in, in politics and in life general, but uh, we think that it's certain and now everything is uncertain. I don't know when the games are going to be played again or when the matches are going to continue. So I, as you already mentioned, uh, your clients that are coming, that are new clients because mm -hmm. they were changing their lifestyle because of the needs of right. this quarantine situation. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, what can you explain, elaborate on this uncertainty and how it's hitting people, hitting in this uh, mindful way? Well, you know, the big thing is that a lot of things in our lives, you know, we used to get up, drive to work, we had lunch, we came home, we had dinner, we watched TV, we went to bed. Now, work's not there, or maybe it's there, but it's at home now, and I'm not moving around as much, and all this stuff. So what I suggest to people to do is that they control what they have control over. They control when they get up in the morning. They control whether they take a shower or not. I like these because they, they have the best spine movement. <laughs> there you go. Meow. Yeah, continue. But you know, you control what you can control. You can't control here in the United States when our governor is going to tell us we can go back to work. We can't control that. Okay, but I can control what I do at my house yeah. or what's going on inside here. I control what's in my mind and everything else. So again, control what you can control. What you can't control, forget about it. Just get, let it go. But this let's is an out. ongoing process. It's not like that you decide I control what I control. The next day is coming and the next day is coming, a new situation. So ego or our wired prog prog programs are wired in a way when I figure something out, it sticks. No, right. your spine needs to move as well and in all different dimensions. So uh, well, One phrase I use with my patients all the time is, life is movement, no movement means no life. And again, you either use it or lose it. Our bodies are designed that way. Your cat's designed that way. Dogs are, every, every animal is designed that way. If they don't move, they will lose the ability to be able to move. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why, for example, when you have an older person go into uh, an United States here called a nursing home, which is where they usually go in until they usually die at that point, but they're bedridden. Well, that's why they step out of bed, they fall down, they break their hip bone. But if you and I fall down, we'll bounce off the ground. We won't break our hip bone because the bone density is strong. Once they get to bed, their body starts taking away that bone density, making the bone more it's brittle. It's needed. It's adjusted right. to lying. Right. So th because they're not moving. So that's why, you know, I hope I can move the rest of my life. Um, I told my kids when I get old, just push me in front of a semi truck and I'll be over with. And I don't mean to be in a mean way, but I don't want to live be being bedridden. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I want to be able to move up until the point I die. And again, well, we, I want to be able to, to move that. here. We need to move here and right. work on all the aspects. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. This, that we this, is, this is what it's certain, movement. Every, this is the only thing that's certain, movement, yeah. You know, whether you're a professional player, whether you're not a professional player, movement, you know, um, that's why I tell people we need to develop a game called full contact chess. Uh-huh. You know, where instead of just moving a piece, you have to move your whole body around. Maybe shoulder the guy or hit him or whatever else. Make it a, a playful game there because then you would actually have a great game with that. But also chess will be now played maybe, you know, with sticks for social distancing and we will see <laughs> the future. Yeah. So back in 2001, uh, we were down in New Zealand for some world powerlifting championships. And we were in a town called Christchurch, which is in the South Island of New Zealand. Yeah. And there they had a chess board out in the community square that the chess pieces were about three, four feet tall. Yeah. And so I got pictures of my sons, my youngest son, Ant or I, I, my third, second son, Anthony, he was about as tall as the piece. So he would bear hug it, yeah. pick it up, walk it to the next That's box it, yeah. and everything else. And they're, they're, my, my, their grandpa and myself were sitting on the side, we're watching them play these huge pieces of chess. That's the kind of chess game we need to do. You have to pick your guy up yeah. and move him. Workout. Yeah. Great. There you go. Uh, maybe the last last thing what about uh, tennis athletes that you are working with uh, and adjusting because tennis is one-sided maybe they play two-handed backhand or forehand uh, whatever the case uh, 
what do you, what what can you say about tennis players, tennis athletes, regarding the adjustments and the workout that they can do? Right. Well, tennis, you know, is very similar to golf in the sense that's a one-sided sport or a uh, a baseball pitcher, which is one-sided and everything else. You need to basically, you know, again, get some movements that you do on your uh, off-season training or even in-season training that you actually are using both sides of your body. Um, obviously, tennis being a one-sided sport, you know, I can't tell you, okay, so take that racket and put it the other hand and hit the ball with it. It doesn't work that way. Um, but you need to be able to train. So for doing like squats or deadlifts, some basic movements, um, even working lunges, but don't just always work a lunge to this side, work a lunge to that side, forward, back, everything else needs to be worked with that. Um, but again, and then to focus on the stretches. So try to have as mu much of your training where you're using both sides of your body, both in a bilateral sense, meaning both hands or feet, and then also single leg. So you do single leg, but maybe I always put more stress on this leg. I need to put stress on this leg as well, too. And the more you do that, when you actually play a tennis match, that you yes, you're okay, I'm using one side, your body will be more resilient to deal with the stresses of that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Body, body is, a, is a very complicated thing, and it's uh, full of complications if you do not know. The, regarding the wisdom and the everything. Uh, the more you know, the more you are aware that you know nothing, in a way. Uh, exactly, but, uh, that's a good point. Uh, but uh, but it, it makes you more uh, humble and uh, aware of uh, how simple it is. You need to move a bit, at least. Uh, I think you have that saying, uh, do as what is necessary, not a lot or something like that. Not, not, not a lot. Uh, I, I saw it on your uh, web page on Instagram. Do only what is necessary, not too much or something in that way. Right, right. Yeah, do as necessary, but don't do too much. Too much is not necessarily better. Yeah. So very good. So yeah. in that way, life is simple. Maybe you can finish on that thought something uh, because you have a lot of ex ex expertise and experience uh, as a practitioner of chiropractic. What can you uh, say about simple, uh, simpleness? You know, the body is a very, is a complex organism. There's things that we still, even with modern medicine, have no idea about. Um, but again, that's why J where Joe Dispenza in his book talked about that. How can this person all of a sudden spontaneously recover from cancer? Okay. A lot of times it has to do with attitude and what's in their brain. Um, my, my, my last comment, I guess, to your listeners is the fact of, you know, if you start seeing some dysfunction happening, but you don't have any pain, have someone other than yourself look at you, you know, do an assessment, whether it be a, a, a physiotherapist, whether it be a chiropractor, whatever else, a trainer, a coach, have them do an assessment on you. Find out where the dysfunction is because it takes a lot less time, money, and energy to fix something when it's small versus when it's big. Now you have to maybe take time off. Here's what I always tell patients. Either make time for your body or down the road, your body will force you to make yeah. time. Yeah. And I don't want the body to force me. I'll make time for it now. But if he forces me to make time later, now I got six months off from a sport or three months off from a sport. So make time for yourself. Great. I might add, and you might also finish, uh, you can also have a take a look at your partner or your mother because they tend to see a lot, but we don't tend to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't use, uh, we get two ears, so we should listen twice as much as we talk. At least that was yeah, taught Because that they way. notice, uh, as I have the experience, people around in family also notice if you limp a bit, if you are a bit uh, in this side or looking like this, and you don't notice, you don't see the difference because you're in your body and maybe you don't sense it because it's uh, already accustomed and adjusted in that way. I agree. That's a very good point. So listeners, pay attention. Thank you very much. I very appreciate it uh, on your time and your exp expressions uh, about everything that entails our spine and, and our body and mind and everything that we touch today. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. It was an honor being here. It was an honor meeting you. And uh, good luck in the future, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Great. There you go. Um, well, I see that you fit in the screen because uh, I've, I've read that to my girlfriend 
and she was like, how strong you are. She said, is he gonna fit inside the, you know, the Zoom call camera, wide screen? <laughs> yes, I will fit, so. I'm a little bit smaller than when I did those uh, lifts. I'm, uh, that back then I was about 275, now I'm about 265. Thank you for tuning in. Follow me on being the Genuine Athlete Instagram and Facebook page. Share, like and comment and be genuine all the way.